Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Gopher Solutions webinar. My name is Tabor Sawatsky. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, this is a monthly webinar focusing on a variety of physical education subjects and topics. Past webinar topics have included PE teachers presenting on specific activities like assessment and fitness. Past presenters have included Dr. Robert Pangrazi, Dr. John Medina, and Jean Blades. Our presenters have done a great job of bringing topics and information that have been useful to the field of physical education. Our webinars will almost always occur the third week of the month, and all attendees of today's webinar will receive a certificate of participation for one hour of educational credit. All attendees will be entered to win an Active and Healthy Schools Activities Card School Pack valued at $179. These cards include classroom and playground activity ideas to easily bring activity breaks to classrooms and to quickly organize activities on the playground. Today's webinar is titled Enhancing Your School's Physical Activity Program with Aaron Beatley. Today Aaron will discuss the importance of physical activity in the classroom and how to develop a multi-component physical activity program. Before I introduce Aaron, I wanted to mention that we will have the chance for questions throughout the presentation and your questions are only visible to me the moderator so feel free to ask any questions you might have during the presentation. Questions can be typed in the questions area on the right hand side of your screen at any time during the webinar and we'll accumulate the questions throughout the presentation and have a chance to address your questions with Aaron at the end of the presentation. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, Aaron Beatley. Aaron holds a PhD from Arizona State University, specializing in physical education and physical activity for youth. He's currently a faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Beatley has worked with school districts, recreation programs, and youth sport organizations across the country in their efforts to maximize physical activity experiences and promote youth to be physically active for a lifetime. He is the author and co-author co of more than 60 research-based and practical articles. In addition, he is, led, he is the lead author on NASPE's Comprehensive School Physical Activity Promotion, and he serves on the Let's Move Active Schools Physical Activity Leader Training Development Team. Beatley is also co-author of five books, Promoting Physical Activity and Health in the Classroom, Pedometer Power, Pedometer Power Second Edition, and dynamic physical education for elementary school children. At this time, I am going to turn the presentation over to our presenter, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Tabor. I want to first start and just say, uh, hey, thank you for everyone for showing up on a Friday. I don't know if it's beautiful there, but it hasn't been beautiful in Lexington in a while, and it is, so it's a, hopefully be a great weekend. Um, I want to thank Gopher for inviting me to present, and as you can see on the PowerPoint, at first I need to before I forget, um, Dr. Heather Irwin has several slides in this presentation that I've um, borrowed from her, and so I just want to acknowledge her as well. Um, the whole idea of comprehensive school physical activity programs is something that's near and dear to my heart, um, something that I've spent some time working with and, and quite a bit of time writing, and, and I think is something that I, I, I hope can potentially impact the, the lives of kids, and I think that active and healthy schools programs are a great way to do that. Um, just to start and lay a little bit of groundwork, um, I think we all know this. I just want to put us all on the same page, that physical activity is a leading health indicator. You can look at all these things, and you've seen these a million times um, since 1996 when the Surgeon General's report came out, the benefits of physical activity. Um, I think it's important to note that the active children, adolescents, favorable body composition, you can look through those. Um, I, I think there's lots of reasons and health benefits to being physically active. The one that we know about, and, and unfortunately I don't think a lot of people do know about, and we're getting the word out pretty well, I think, um, more and more, that physical activity is a leading academic indicator as well, or a leading learning indicator that's been called as well. Um, this is primarily through, if you look at some of um, Rady's work and, and some other work from Chuck Hillman at, at University of Illinois, that it's, it's blood flow to the brain is the, is the primary role in this. And, and we know when that happens that with some other research that we can decrease behavior problems and increase attention. And if you talk to most classroom teachers, they will tell you that if I can get my kids to behave and pay attention, I can teach them. 
and and we have that. I, I don't want to say it's a magic bullet. I don't want to say it's a magic pill because some people were over medicating kids and things like that. It, it's not a pill, and I've made that mistake in presentations before. It, it does help, and we can decrease behavior problems and increase attention while improving students' health. It's a win-win for everyone, and I think it's important to um, to lay those out first and foremost. The other thing I want to just real to clarify is we're talking about comprehensive school physical activity programs, and the first thing is on this list is what we're trying to promote. We want kids to move. Any activity is good activity. I hear a lot of people say, oh, we need kids to exercise. Well, if your goal is to get fit, and I won't go off onto that tangent on fitness and, and especially prepubescent kids, but we want kids to be active. Some students will choose exercise, but we want to promote physical activity for everyone. Exercise and physical activity are behaviors. Fitness is an attribute um, that you have basically how well you do in fitness testing. And we are, I, I, I want to be really clear that we're focusing on physical activity, any movement. It doesn't have to be movement designed to get you fit. It's just movement because the health benefits come from those physical, that physical activity. And it's just a, a good way to think about physical activity. I use this in a lot of presentations. One, because it took me a long time to get all those um, raindrops on there, the white streaks on this one. But I think it's a great term, and it means that there are a variety of things that we're trying to promote. We want kids, if they love to dance, dance. If you like to hike, hike. If you like sports, great. If you like exercise, great. But just move. And that's what we're trying to get more and more of at the school level. Another little side tangent here, just a little bit about um, what some reports and, and why I, re I refer to this one is this is a pretty good comprehensive source on this whole idea of physical activity and academic performance. And there are other sources for health and other areas, but this just targets physical activity, <clears throat> excuse me, with physical education classes, recess, classroom breaks, anything that can happen um, at school and focuses on cognitive abilities and things that it benefits. And really the big so what of, of this report um, is that physical activity can impact academic performance. Um, I've already talked about that. I've already talked about um, impact cognitive skills, positively impact cognitive skills. The one I want to talk a little bit about is that we can offer a lot of physical activity and not decrease academic performance. This one's big, and this this is one that, that I think we sometimes we go a little bit too far and say, if you do, if you let kids be active, they'll do better on your tests. And that's not exactly what we're saying. We're saying if you academic performance are things like behavior and things of that nature, but it, cognition is part of, of academic performance. So I think the important piece is that just because we offer time for physical activity does not mean that your your academic performance is going to um, go away or decrease. So if we're going to do this, and Beatley, you're going to tell me that physical activity has health benefits and learning benefits and all this, how are we going to do this? And I think there's several things to think about. And, and one thing that that uh, the NASB came out with the Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program um, position statement that kind of got the groundswell going on this. And, and what a Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program, and you can see it's a, a multifaceted approach, and it basically takes advantage of any time that we can think of during the school day that kids can be active. And you can look at the components. Physical education is the foundation, has to be there. Um, physical activity during school, before and after school, family and community engagement, and staff involvement. Very, very comprehensive. Um, this, by the way, this graphic um, is the Let's Move Active School graphic from, uh, I think it's 2013. It's what's being used right now. Um, so, so we have this kind of framework to uh, how we're going to promote physical activity, and it's somewhat comprehensive because most of the things we talk about in schools to get kids active fit into one of these circles. The other nice piece of this is there, as I said, there's a groundswell of support. Um, it's a significant part of the education sector of the National Physical Activity Plan. If you haven't looked at that, I would encourage you to. Um, NASB has position statements and is currently working on a physical activity leader training. American Heart Association, National Football League with American Dairy Council, has fuel up to play 60. Let's move back to school. I talked about Alliance for a Healthier Generation. The list goes on and on and on. And there's so many that I'm forgetting because I don't have someone here. But we have the support, and 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 we have that now for to a, for a comprehensive school physical activity program. We have the national support, and what we need is the local support. And the local support starts with a champion. My perspective is is that physical educators are the most <laughs> excuse me, well-trained individuals to do this. They know schools, they know physical activity, they know what kids like, they know the parents, they know the ins and outs, all these things, a great set of tools to be a, a physical activity champion. If that's not in the place, 
there are other ways that can be, that this can happen. But I think the key with this for a need for a champion is that it's going to take a village. And so many times when I talk to physical educators, they think, how am I going to do all of that? And that's never my objective. My objective is, is that the comprehensive school physical activity program is a menu and say you want to improve recess and try and get some family involved. Great. Those are the things you pick. It doesn't have to be all of this. It just has to be some. And But it's going to take a village. You're going to have to get parents involved. You're going to have to get probably some other teachers involved. You might have to get, if you're doing a safe perhaps a school event, you might have to get the police involved to make sure the routes are safe. Um, so I think that, that if we have this um, champion that spearheads this and leads this, but it's going to take an entire village to really make this happen. Um, it's not just one person. One person is going to get to really get burn out on this. So I think that we have to have a champion. We have the national support, and we need the local support and local champions to do this. So based on those those uh, five components I talked about, I'm going to sp spend, some, spend some time today talking about specific ones during um, quality physical education, but then I'm going to really spend some time talking about classroom and recess, which Active and Healthy Schools spend, uh, uh, is, is primarily focused on. Quality physical education. I spend time on this because I think it has to be the foundation. Um, if you have a program where the students are sitting for 25 to 30 minutes during a 45-minute lesson, and then you go to the principal and say, hey, I have this great idea. I want kids to be active during school. And the principal comes and watches you teach and says, well, how about we get them active during PE first, and then you can ask everybody else to start getting kids active. So I think physical education has to be the foundation. And quality physical education, as we know, standards-based. There are five standards now focused on physical literacy. Um, those standards and that curriculum need to be implemented with best practices. Um, we need to be efficient. We don't get students very much. And if we spend time talking or saying, are there any questions, or rambling on and on about the importance of something that when, when students could be active, we are physical educators. We have other content we, we should be teaching. Um, that we are teaching and we have other objectives, but we have to make physical activity our core and we have to be student-centered, which means we're based on the needs of students. I remember I had a high school program that we had uh, our units work. We had all year long every other day. We had football, basketball, and track and field. And it was, we didn't have football. My school was a real tiny school, but we had um, a PE teacher that played football at Ohio State. And we had a, he was the basketball coach and the track and field coach. So it was very student, very teacher centered. It was what he was good at. And incidentally, none of those do I participate now as a lifelong activity. So I think we need to make sure that we're student centered in our quality physical education. And I've always said, and I think it's a summary, and that we, we need to prepare kids to be active for a lifetime and provide them the attitude, skills, and knowledge to do so. And we know, we can see this study from uh, Chuck Morgan, he's at the University of Hawaii now. Um, 30 minutes of quality physical education can contribute as much as 20 minutes of, or 20 percent of a child's total physical activity. How we did this is we measured kids' students' activity levels with pedometers all day, and then during PE we put different pedometers on them. And you can see that there's some low active, the low active, middle active, and high active kids, but during PE they were all about the same. Some of those low active kids, if they weren't active during the, again, this uh, about 7,500 steps is a mean. If they weren't active during PE, they were getting about 1,000 steps a day. And I would encourage you to try to only get a thousand steps in a day. Um, it's very difficult. You have to be efficient, and you have to try. And those kids were only getting a thousand, so we have to try and, and just PE in general. With the, with the whole sample that we had was 20 minutes, 30 minutes of PE was 20 percent of their activity level. Again, I think that doesn't speak much to their total activity level, but it does speak to the significance of PE. The Next thing I want to talk about, and this is where we start to get into the active and healthy schools, is this whole idea of classroom physical activity. We are doing a lot of this. Um, I think it's gotten a lot better in, a lot in recent years um, in, in CPA's classroom physical activity. It's one area to get kids up and active, and it can be a meaningful accumulated amount of physical activity. We know that. We've done research on that, that they can get kids up and active. The one thing that I would like to start us saying a little more about is that physical activity in the classroom is not just this nuisance that somebody, the PE teacher comes and asks the classroom teacher, will you do this? I think we need to look at physical activity as another way of teaching. For some students, RTI works. For some students, you know, they love smart boards. 
My daughter wanted a smart board for Christmas. I had to be the bearer of bad news. But they love that. And for some students, getting them up and moving is energizing, and they love it, and it helps them. And I think if we can start getting teachers to look at it, it's not just something else you have to do, but another way of teaching. We're going to have a lot more um, success, and you're going to see some of these barriers later on that, that teachers identify. This is just a, a kind of a rehashing of some of the data before that classroom-based physical activity doesn't detract, improves on-task behavior, improves concentration. It's not just specific reading and math skills. It's not just math. It's physical activity doesn't work for science or physical activity doesn't work for foreign languages. It's just these studies we're looking at reading and math. So um, I don't want to be misleading with this reading and math skills. But there are lots of benefits to getting kids up and active in the classroom, as we've already talked about. This is an interesting one with teacher perceptions. Um, interesting, this is from a study we, um, or a visit we did to schools out in Mesa, Arizona, and I would encourage you to look into what they're doing. It's exciting stuff across the board with physical education, especially at the elementary level, um, with a lot of things that they're doing with active and healthy schools. Um, but this is a sixth grade class. You can see this, this young man in the red shirt. He's about six foot tall. You can't see his buddy. His buddy's about five foot tall next to him, maybe even shorter. But the key to this picture is the teacher in the background. She's doing the activity breaks for them. These are all, um, uh, online activities that are up on the screen, and they're doing the activities. Um, for the most part, you can see what we're finding is children enjoy it, positive part of the student's day, the kids love it, those types of things is, is perceptions of what teachers are thinking. But they also have this issue of uh, there's not infrastructure, it's not a high priority, they don't think, they don't, they don't think highly of physical education to begin with, which is another role of a physical educator could go to a classroom teacher and invite them to CPE because for the most part the classroom teacher sees you picking the kids up at the door and sees them lined up at the end of the day at the end of the lesson they don't have any idea what happened in between other than the kids are sweating well we don't know did they just run them like when I was a kid no we can show them what quality physical education is so that can help alleviate some of these barriers um, but this is what teachers are reporting as well they're not using it much and I think part of the reason they're not using as much is we haven't provided them the resources. Frankly, they're not going to go look for resources, most classroom teachers. We have to supply it for them. And they need support for this, and this is where this whole champion for physical activity comes in, and this is where the whole active and healthy schools can have a huge impact. And you can see these kids in this, these pictures. Um, these were unbelievable classrooms, by the way. I don't know if you can see on the left, but every one of those pictures up on the top are the silhouettes of the students every year. She does it every year, which is unbelievable. She's a phenomenal teacher. And the lady, the teacher of the students in the red was phenomenal as well. Um, but it's just an idea of what it looks like to get kids up and active. Kids can control themselves. They're not even very well spaced in this bottom picture, but they were active in controlling themselves, and it was just amazing to see. So if we're going to do this activity in, in classroom breaks, I think we need something. And not all public schools are going to have, um, have access to Internet or have access to technology. Um, we're getting there, but I, I realize that most schools don't. And I think that's where the Active and Healthy Schools program can really help um, teachers in getting kids active. Basically how this works is there are a set of cards, and I'll show some pictures of them in a second, and these cards were developed based on some interactions with classroom teachers that said, we don't want a four-page lesson plan for an activity to get kids active in our PE class. We want something short, sweet, to the point. So these cards are five, six, seven bullets, how to play the game, what equipment is needed, very little equipment is needed because we don't want that to be a barrier. There are some activities that kids can lead. Once you've led them a few times as a teacher, kids can would benefit greatly from leading them and, and would have a great time. It can be a reward um, if you're the leader of the day or the top dog or whatever you call it in your class. Um, I think that, that we can get kids up and active. I, I know this works at the high school level as well um, with not line leaders, obviously, at high school, but there are ways that we can get kids up in class and engage students in physical activity and not have them just sit and get in depth by PowerPoint. Um, so I think that we um, you can do them in a classroom setting. And the, the big part of this is that you can integrate academic content. You don't have to. Sometimes, sometimes physical activity breaks are just for physical activity, just to get them up and moving because they're getting fidgety. Um, but there are times that it works. I was just talking to a poster presentation about six months ago with a middle school teacher that he said, oh, my gosh, we were talking about that. I had a poster on this very topic, and he said, oh, my gosh, when I was teaching, they, they just get fidgety. I'd just get them up and make them jump up and down. And, you know, what? That would work, I mean, but it would be nice to be something a little bit, but more fun than that. And, and there are ways that we can integrate content, counting, um, lots of ways, and these cards provide that. 
and this is just a picture of the cards. Now, I will say that the cards say K2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, we have some uh, former teachers here that are foreign students of ours at UK that teach in local schools that are K. Some of the schools are K8. And they simply, what they do is they take some of these 5, 6 content and they um, just increase the, uh, the knowledge and, and what kids need to know. I'll be honest, they have taken some of the K2 ones as well and said, if we change this into nouns and verbs, then this will be a better activity, those types of things. So the, the idea is to give teachers ideas in their hands because, frankly, the teachers know the content better than we do. We can provide them resources, and then hopefully they will expand on it and say, yeah, this will work, this will work. Some of our research we've done with classroom teachers, one teacher in particular was very resistant to the idea of using this, and she was the teacher that was giving us the most ideas. She said, if you change this activity, it could be science and math. If you change this activity, I know my daughter's class in eighth grade could use this. And uh, again, just the groundswell support starts when you start energizing teachers, just providing them a resource. And this is just an example of, of, a, of a game and what the cards look like. You can see they're hinged together. That little white dot is a hinge. Um, and what we found most teachers will do is they'll just sit them on their um, desk, or if they see the kids getting fidgety, they go grab one and say, okay, Sherlock Holmes is the activity they've liked recently, so we'll try it. And you know how kids are. It'll change next week what they like, but it, you know, that's kind of the fun of it and finding out exactly what the activity is. But you can see there's no equipment. We have other variations on the bottom. And again, these are just variations that were thought of. Lots of things could change um, and could be used for other ideas and other activities as well. So moving on from uh, Classroom activities and moving to recess. This is another thing, another time of day that students can be active that um, the active and healthy schools can assist with. Uh, interesting, I wrote a, a brief recently, um, well, I guess not recently, it was a long time, two years ago, but that, and what we found when I wrote this brief is there was really no set definition of what recess was, and frankly, it's probably because we didn't need to define it. Now we have policies that are cutting recess and all these and making kids run laps and all these things, so we decided, decided to have a recess definition, and the key on this is, I think, in this definition is kids are choosing. They get to choose whether they're active or what activity they participate in, and when you take that away, that takes away the true spirit of, of recess, and I think that's an important piece of this, and you can see what it provides. And, some would argue, well, hey, recess gives them a chance to be active. Maybe, maybe not. Um, recess, the research suggests that it's a wide range of activity, but if you, we don't intervene, they're usually down around that 15 to 16 percent. And we know that if we do intervene, it can be a significant part of their physical activity. And then also what we know about recess is it's not required a lot, and that when we offer recess, activity breaks throughout the school day, it can improve. Um, behavior and concentration. So we know a little bit about recess, and interestingly, the um, something I came across when I was writing this active living research brief is that students in the city, students in the southeast, students of, of a higher percentage of schools with higher percentage of minority and higher percentage of free and reduced lunch um, had less recess opportunities. And what we also know is that these are also the populations with the largest health disparities. And not saying that. This is the recess is the reason for those health disparities, but it's just another thing that we're removing from those populations that has health benefits, and we're it appears it's systematically removing that. So, what works at recess? Immediately, you say we're going to do recess. What works? These are from uh, some studies that we did, or some visits we did over in England that they've done a lot of work with recess and these super. This is it's a good picture, but it's, the kids are inactive. The kids weren't act, inactive much after this picture. What these two gentlemen are, they're recess supervisors. They were explaining the game they were going to be playing that day, and then the kids are out and active. Um, this was in England, so they had coach, and it was raining all the time. Um, but we've also done this in, uh, with a colleague of mine. At, she's at Arizona State now, Jen Huberty, looking at training recess supervisors, and we know that this is something that if we give them the ideas, it can help. Also, planning, painting playgrounds, murals, activity lines, um, Recess is one that we've kind of missed the boat on at middle school and high school. And if, if, if we can look back and say, well, why does it disappear? I really don't have a good answer for you why it disappears at middle school and high school. I will tell you that if you give them recess at middle school and high school, they'll use it. They might just be social, um, but if you have them providing them opportunities, they will be active. And, and things like painting playground lines, I mean, it's simple to put. Foursquare. I was at a middle school. I was a high school recently, and um, at a workshop actually, and the teachers were telling me about it. And it was in Texas, and they did aerobic foursquare, 
where when you hit a ball in a square, you follow it to that square. So you're moving. It's chaotic. There's really no clue what's going on. But everybody's active and it's fun. Lots of laughing going on. And high schoolers play it. They like it. And I think sometimes we say, ah, they're not going to like those. They're baby games. Nah, they like it. If we provide them the opportunity. If you've ever done a youth work, um, youth group workshop and used to parachute, brings out great memories for kids, and they, the, especially high school kids, and they love that. So what else works at recess? This is one where um, Active and Healthy Schools is really going to uh, help is this whole idea of activity zones. And this is just zoning off areas, and this is the soccer zone. This is the new activity of the, of the week zone or recess activity of the week. This over here is an area where they're going to dance and, and having specific space. It provides some safety as well, but letting kids know exactly where the activities are. We also know that providing equipment works. If you send them out to an empty grass field, they'll find something to do, and it's not always what we want them to do. They don't need big structures like slides and swing sets, but they can use um, playground balls, jump ropes, those types of things, and that works. And this picture here is a group of students checking out. They were in charge of checking out equipment. Students gave them a token, and they got their token back when they brought the equipment back, which minimizes loss. But also, the last point here is that we integrate a lot of these ideas. It will help, and, and we can integrate low cost. Again, low cost, 500 bucks for some equipment. And a little bit of training helps them, you know, a PE teacher can train some uh, recess supervisors say, hey, this is a game that I'm teaching a PE this week. See if the kids will play at recess. And, again, I don't think that we have to spend a ton of money on this, but I think at some time we have to say, you know, we need to spend some money to make it good for kids. This is a, so with active and healthy schools, this whole idea of activity zones, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that right now. Um, so you, you zone the playground. It can be sports zones. It can be learning zones where they're learning a new activity. Um, when we first started, we had no parking zones. I'm more of a fan of finding out why the kids parked and then provide them those activities. There's typically a walking and jogging track. Um, there's an activity promotion aid. This can be the classroom teacher, they need, but they are or the aide or a para or whomever is in charge of that. But we encourage them to be active and, and talking to kids, motivating kids, showing them new activities, those types of things. This can also be a service learning for high school students. Um, I know some of the PE teachers here in Lexington have service learning students that show up and they can come around lunchtime or recess time. It would be great. Um, and then there's also the idea of having lunch hour clubs and that those clubs can meet in certain areas as well um, and, and benefit from these the activity zones. That, again, all this is laid out in the Active and Healthy Schools um, manual. The active, act, the activity zones, activities. Um, usually it's partners or small groups. We don't want games that require 12 on 12. A, they're not going to be much activity, but B, the odds of getting 12 kids at one time that want to do the same thing is not great. Um, so we like smaller group activities. Um, or again, not a lot of equipment, some equipment. I mean, we don't need 75 playground balls out there. It, it, it's, you need some equipment. And typically they don't require a large area to play. Um, one of the things that we're finding is that the PE teacher can teach some of these activities as well. Um, one of the studies I did out in, when I was in Southern California is we looked at activity levels of students during recess, and, and we were out observing while we were collecting data, and the kids were playing four-ball soccer, and I asked the PE teacher, I said, why are they playing four-ball soccer? And the teacher said, well, only four kids brought their ball that day. I was like, well, I, I, he said, we teach four-ball soccer in the, in the PE, in PE, and then if five kids bring a soccer ball, they play five balls that day. And so it was just a, an easy way to, to incorporate some of these active um, concepts. And this is just a layout of what it would look like. This is courtesy of um, Deb Pangrazy out in uh, Mesa Schools in Arizona. Um, you can see this is such the orange here. The big building on the right by the cars is an office, and then the little buildings are all for grade levels. And then you can see a big track around the outside. Zone 7 might be for a recess activity of the week. Zone 8 might be for um, some kind of ultimate frisbee or throwing a football that day. Zone one might be for um, uh, dancing. We know that that's kind of activity. We need to be sensitive to genders and things like that. So it's just an idea of what it would look like. And then these are the activities that are designed for the, for the um, cards that are designed for recess. Again, by no means that you can only do these activities. It's just meant to give an idea of what, and it's helpful for an aide or a para or a teacher that has, has, doesn't have a lot of familiarity with some of these games. And again, if you teach these in PE, it'd be pretty easy for the kids to teach the teacher how to teach it as well. Um, another thing that can be done is, is this whole idea of just renaming the playground the activity zone. Just sends a different message. Having a walking and jogging path. Um, recess is activity time. It's, it is recess, but again, just sending that message, we're going out to be active. 
And I would argue that they did not, it's not necessarily a recess from learning. I think they're learning things, but I think we have to send this message. It's, we're going out to be active, and here we go. This is just an example of a sign that you can make that would showcase, and then here it is on, on the, um, by a door, that this is the activity zone, here's what we're doing. I've worked with a school that's similar to the Notre Dame sign that all the players hit when they go out. They have it um, right by the door, and all the students hit the sign when they go out. The activity zone, activity zone, we're going out to be active. Again, just getting them jazzed up about being physically active. This is a sign, um, I believe Gopher has this in the catalog. This is, it looks like a paper sign. This is a, like an official street sign that you can put on and show people where the walking path is. Um, and then, obviously, they need equipment. And, and this is just an example of a, a, a equipment pack that is available that can provide a variety of activities. I would encourage having all this activity, all this equipment out at the same time. Um, I know from teaching that if you had all this out, you'd get one, probably one frisbee back, and that's it. So you have to be diligent. When I was teaching, we had color coded equipment, so the first grade had a certain, um, first grade had a certain color, second grade had a certain color. So if we found a playground out there that was a certain color, we knew what grade level it was, should have belonged to, and we let them know that we had it. You typically didn't give them back to them for a few days just to um, let them, you know, sweat it out a little bit. Because, you know, in your first grade, it worries you that somebody found your playground ball. This is the manual that's available um, on Gopher's website as well in the catalog, and I'm just going to go through a little bit of what this manual has in it. It has an overview of kind of the things we've talked about. It has some ideas how to get started. Um, how to create your active playgrounds with activity zones and signage and things like that. Um, how to rework your whole school environment and nutrition and sun safety and learning activity outside of school. Again, all of this comes into this whole idea of a comprehensive school physical activity program. And I, I really think these are things that we really have to start promoting and start looking into as, as we move forward in, in education. Um, Again, these are just some of the materials that are available. There's the activity cards, uh, point of decision prompts. I have some examples here in a second. Um, these are great when you're kicking this off. Have your, if you're a teacher and you have a bulletin board, have your bulletin board. Spend a little bit of time talking about it. Say, hey, this is an activity you can do out at recess today. We end the curriculum that we use. Um, we end every lesson with a game, three to five minutes of a game. And I know of teachers that have used that. I know of teachers that have taught new games, put up their um, flip phone or a flip cam and show themselves teaching the activity and then show it at, at, at lunchtime. Another idea is to put recess before lunch, and that's a whole other issue. If you're interested in that, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. But I think there's lots of things that we can do to really kick this off in these point of decisions. Monthly activity, nutrition, newsletters are in there, examples, and by no means are you um, required. It's not, you know, you don't have to do this and you have to do this. It's just giving ideas, and some of them are the first time, great, I'm going to use this, and I'm going to create my own um, and then, you know, creating activity programs for classroom teachers. One of the things that we need to go to classroom teachers and say, we care about you. Classroom teachers are stressed. And we can say, look, we'll provide an activity program for you. And we'll do a phenomenal program or we'll do, an, an, we'll do some kind of, we'll remind you to drink more water. We'll remind you of this and, and have an impact on them as well and reaching out to the classroom teachers. Because if you want them to integrate physical activity, it's always nice to do something for them first. This is just an example of, of a prompt. Uh, you are what you eat. This would be something great to have as they walk into a um, into the uh, cafeteria. Um, activities for everybody. Again, all these signs. It could be part of a, bill, uh, a bulletin board, um, et cetera. This is a biggie. Um, again, this is, has its roots in Air, this program has its roots in Arizona, but um, it's used everywhere. And I think anywhere you live, the best way to get kids active is to send them outside. But when you send them outside, you send them out in the sun's harm. And so I think this is an important um, component. Um, I know my daughters have, they take sunscreen to school, and when they go, especially when it starts to get warmer out, and, but it, they should be doing it any time, but they have, usually have long sleeves and hats on here because it's cold, but, well, cold to them. Um, so I think this is another thing that we can use and have point of decision prompts to, to get kids um, thinking about this. Something else that's in this is this whole healthy eating module, which is a little bit out of my area of expertise, but, you know, one of the areas I know I've worked with um, Bob Pangrazy out in Mesa, and, and one of the things they had some resistance to including healthy yogurt and fruit, but now that's the best seller they have. And one of the things they did is they offered stickers with healthy eating choices, um, promoting brown, brown bag lunches. Teachers walk around or the um, lunch monitors walk around, they see somebody eating something healthy, they give them a sticker. I know it's not a big deal for a sticker for us, 
but there are people that will run a marathon for a T-shirt. So we know that people will do things for little things. Um, those little shoe tokens break the thing for kids as well. Um, eliminate food as a fundraiser. It doesn't seem like a lot, but my daughter has 26 kids in her class, and if each one brings a cupcake, that's about an extra pound a week that they're a pound a year that they're going to get. Um, there are other alternatives to this. If you have a great activity zone, then you know fundraisers and, and those types of things can be used. I know schools that have used fundraisers for bringing in money to get an extra activity break and those types of things. Um, and the food and nutrition fact of the day on the announcements somewhere that they learn this, that they are exposed to that kind of stuff. So I'm Stacy, I talked a little bit about it, but there are information in there on how to implement your intervention, Sunwise materials, um, there's those signs, there's activities that you can do to reinforce those concepts. I think it's a nice um, touch and a way to just, again, kids know this and they come home. I mean, think about if you have kids, think about the things that come home that they've heard all year long that they never forget. And if they hear sun safety or being physically active or making food choices all year long, we're getting somewhere. If they're sick of hearing it, that's great. They've heard it and they kids need to keep hearing it. Outside of school programs, um, actually I have a, a former master's student that looked at activity homework. What he did is he combined a calendar with activity homework and he didn't grade the homework. He just was monitoring whether kids would participate in activity and he used pedometers. And he found if you give kids activities that they can do alone or with a partner, they're more apt to be active outside of school. And it doesn't mean that that they, you grade them and say, oh, you didn't do this, or your parents didn't sign this, but they can learn to track their own activities with this. If you, a, a little bit different approach, but they can learn to log their, how long they're active watching TV, whether they're active during commercials or not. An average sitcom is, is I think, 23 minutes, and that's seven minutes of activity if you're active during this, um, the commercials. Again, little things, we can teach that in PE. And then I encourage out-of-school programs, working with YMCA's, Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, I've worked with some programs here um, and I, you, you walk in and you say, look, if, if you say freeze, every kid in this school knows to put their hands on their knees. And after school staff just look at you like, oh, wow. And it works. And, and, and you know what? If you play this game, you have a lot fewer behavior problems because every kid likes it, not just some kids. And these are the things that we can do as a physical activity champion. And, and all this information is laid out in this active and healthy schools um, manual in this out of school module. So in summary, um, I think the big picture is that we know that physical activity is good for kids. For schools, the big thing is that it helps learning and it doesn't decrease academic performance. And if we're going to do that, we have this whole idea of a comprehensive school physical activity program, and active and healthy schools can help you implement several of those components and, and really um, start moving things forward to change the culture of the school into an activity culture where learning is taking place. Thanks, Aaron. Um, we'll, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you have any questions that came up throughout Aaron's presentation, feel free to um, put those in the questions area on the right-hand side. We've got a number of questions uh, and some good ones here that we're going to get to. Um, there were a, quite a few questions kind of surrounding the manual, and some of those came in prior to um, Aaron when you got into the manual. But could you um, give us a little bit of background as to um, you know where it came from. Um, there's a question about any any research-based things that have been done with Active and Healthy Schools program. Um, what its intention was um, when it was developed. Um, I've got some background on some of that. So if you want to, you know, if you want to address that, and that can maybe fill in anything um, also. Yeah, it was um, Bob Pangrazy is the original author, and I, I think the the whole idea. And, and frankly, I will be honest, it came out before the Comprehensive School Physical Activity. The, the whole groundswell behind the scenes was happening, and this came out, and I, I think it was uh, well ahead of its time, frankly. Um, but I think the idea was to just change the culture of a school um, to one that incorporates physical activity. I mean, we know that schools are, are, are swamped with what they have to do, but I think if we can provide them with ways that do this that are unobtrusive and cost-effective, um, it, it helps tremendously, and it's one of the things that teachers want. And frankly, you know, I know there are, most schools you go in, they're not going to spend eight, nine, ten thousand dollars on something. I mean, so if you can bring them in and, and have a resources that are provided to you that are pretty cost effective, frankly, compared to other things, I think this is it's one of those ideas that just to change the culture of the school, show teachers different ways to do this, and take advantage of the opportunities that we have now. I mean, most schools offer recess. 
And if kids go out to recess for 20 minutes and they're active for five, something needs to change and we need to intervene. And, and I think this offers a lot of potential for impacting that. Tamer, there's one other piece of your question I didn't answer. Um, is um, Active and Healthy Schools program, is it research-based? Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, we've done some work with uh, the recess piece. Heather Irwin has done more work with the classroom piece and looking at these cards um, to see how active kids are. It's one of these crazy things we we have to do research to show that if you teach math with physical activity, kids will be more active than if you teach math kids sitting down. Um, but we have to do that, and we have to show it, and we've done that, and if I can get you some references if you want to put them online or something. But, um, okay. yes, those pieces have. And then we've looked at the recess stuff with activity zones and things with Jen Huberty, um, H-U-B-E-R-T-Y, at, uh, she's at Arizona State University. Um, so that can be looked at as well. And we based that entire grant. was funded from Active Living Research on active and healthy schools. Great. And one thing, too, I should mention, um, there's a website, activeandhealthyschools.com, um, that also has some, some more information about the manual. It has a, um, a piece on there to assess your school. Um, and the Active and Healthy Schools program, um, Aaron mentioned it was you know kind of ahead of its time. It wasn't designed, it was really designed to be administered by the physical education teacher as a way to get schools active and healthy in areas outside of the typical physical education program, you know, areas of the classroom activity, um, organizing the research, getting the nutrition pieces into the, into the food choices, um, and getting, you know, some of the after school activity, the sun safety, things like that. Um, one person asked, you know, is it, a, is it a free program? Do I need to buy it? The program, the manual itself is $94, $95 in our Gopher catalog. But one thing I wanted to mention about that, in the back there is a DVD that has reproducibles on almost everything in the program. So the point of decision signs, um, newsletters to, to parents about what's happening, just an absolute ton of materials um, that can be reproduced and changed um, to your discretion that will tailor to your school, um, you know, to kind of get this active and healthy school um, movement going throughout, throughout a school. Um, another question that came through, um, the time frame for the activities, and this person um, was, I think, kind of more specific on the um, the recess and maybe even the classroom activities. So um, maybe you can speak first of all, Aaron, a little bit to you know how often the, the classroom activities uh, might take place in a class. I think you touched on it, but maybe reiterate a little bit um, how a classroom activity plan might be put in place and how often it would be used with a classroom teacher. Yeah, I, it's a really good question. Um, ideally, the, the activities are designed to last four to six minutes, not much longer than that, because much longer than that, and, and the kids start getting, you know, it's one of the, just the activities aren't designed for that. They're the kids you have behavior problems and things like that. Um, so, so keeping that in mind, what we recommend is every 50, I think it was on the slide and I skipped over, every 50 minutes or so, give the kids a break. And, and that's what we recommend. And when we've worked with some grants and stuff with some classroom teachers, every class is different. And the teachers will tell you every class is different every year. So some teachers are like, man, I can't get the 50 minutes. They start getting fidgety at 35. Great, give them a break. And what most teachers are finding is, and we, the ones I've talked to, and this is all anecdotal, and not we didn't do any qualitative data, but they will they say that when they first started this, they didn't think they had time for activity breaks. And now they think they don't have time to not do the physical activity breaks. And so as a teacher, it's up to you how to some teachers schedule it and they say, by golly, every hour on the hour, we're going to do an activity break. And that works for them. Some teachers have to be a little more fluid with it and say, okay, I'm going to do a five minute break here or, you know what, the kids really like this and we'll do it a little bit longer. And, and so it's a little bit more fluid. Um, with respect to recess, I'm a, a more of a proponent of instead of um, giving kids 30 minutes of recess once a day, give them 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon. And frankly, I, if you don't give any at recess, I, mean, I would rather have something at recess. But if you say you only get 30 minutes, what are you going to do with it? I would rather put it in morning and afternoon because it, it gives them, if you're not going to do activity breaks, it gives them a break. And I also know that kids are intermittently active. And if you give them 30 minutes of activity, they're probably not going to be active. Then, so if, you, if I give them 15 minutes and they're active for 10, that's a lot of activity, 10 minutes and 15, 10 minutes of activity out of 15 minutes allocated for activity. But if you give them a half hour, they're probably not going to be active for 20. They're going to be tired. So if you can give them 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon, as well as they get a break when they're having lunch. Um, but there's also a push, and again, I'm chasing my tail on this, I know. 
Um, there's also a push to have recess before lunch and give kids recess before they have lunch, and I think it's a great idea. Um, so I think there's a variety of ways it can approach and, and, and get kids a lot of activity and schedule that into the day. Good. A um, number of questions um, addressing the recess piece. And, you know, from my experience in talking to um, teachers who have been interested in this, that has been one of the pieces that they're the most interested in, in, in organizing that research, recess area. Um, one question or a couple of questions that have kind of asked a little bit about, um, you know, northern climates and even large grassy areas um, as opposed to blacktop areas. But, Aaron, maybe you could speak a little bit to, um, it seems like one of the main objectives of the Active and Healthy Schools from a recess standpoint is just to, to organize your recess area so you don't get, you know, half the kids you know, sitting sitting around talking, and the other half, you know, playing catch with a football. But you've got some organization to the activity. Maybe speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I mentioned a little bit that providing this structure, a there's a safety that you don't have kids trying to play football at a right angle to the kids trying to play soft or soccer, or the kids trying to play ultimate frisbee. So there's that structure that provides that. Um, and I think with respect to um, with respect to recess. I think that when we when we let it just come, like you said, just the kids just hanging out and not having an aid that's supporting that, I think that we can um, we can move towards this idea of getting kids active and and using some of these resources. Um, I'm, I'm completely lost train of thought here, but I, I, help me out. Just explain your question again. Yeah, the question, question. You know, I think there's Are, some some question about you know is is the is the program very specific in how you have to organize your your recess area. Um, and from, you know, what I've seen in my experience is that it's more about um, just organizing it to say, here's an activity zone for this, an activity zone yeah. for this, for this, for this. And that's what really drives that activity. Um, cause, you know, as, as you know, you get, you know, the unorganized activity has some benefit too, but you tend to have the kids that are going to, you know, sit and chat, and then, you know, the group over here that's going to, you know, play catch with a football, you know, kind of a pickup game all day long. And you, you don't get that the, kind of that middle ground with the walking path and some of these other activity areas where you just kind of, you know, organize it, and that's what drives the activity. Yeah, I think, that, again, it, it's not – what I don't want to have people hear me say is this structured recess because it's not right. – the teacher goes out and tells every kid what they have to play. That works for some kids. Therefore, one of the zones is a structured – could be a structured activity. But there's not a specific – I was working with a school, and they said, oh, I, I, you know, they gave me a plot. And I said, well, what about if you put – I didn't know anything about the school. I, I just had the plot. And I said, what if you put soccer over here and you put this? And they said, no, 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 no. We can't do it that way. I was like, well, what's the problem? They said, well, the kids always play soccer over here. I'm like, well, great. Make that the activity zone. Make that the soccer zone. That's fine. I don't have any issues with that. It's, so it's not specific in that. It's just that there's some structure to foster activity. And it's not, you know, you're going to put the stations out for activity zones out for the first eight kids, for the first eight stations. And there are going to be some activities that don't resonate, that resonate with none of the kids. And there are going to be some activities that kids love. And some kids aren't going to like any of them. And this activity promotion aid, you go and talk to those kids. What kind of activities do you like? And lo and behold, that's the activity we have next week and or next day, for that matter. And and that can, again, provide some motivation. And it's some, wow, somebody cared about me and found out an activity I like and, and was able to integrate that activity. And I think that's where we can start having success. Good. Okay. Um number of questions about what the website was. Again, activeandhealthyschools.com. I just sent a... Um, a note to all of the attendees um, with that website. Um, let's see, getting back to, um, we had some questions about um, a sample classroom lesson. Um, could you just give us one example, Aaron? And if you don't have one off the top of your head, let me know. I've got some of the, you know, the cards here too. But the cards that Aaron was talking about in the presentation, they're designed either at the classroom level or at the recess level. They're a, they're a nice size. You can stick it in your pocket, have it on, your, on a classroom desk. Um, durable, but very easy to reference. That's the big thing. You, you take one card, you open it up, um, everything's on the back. It's something that you can quickly administer right now. They aren't, um, you know, it's not a detailed lesson plan with a, you know, an objective and a meeting this standard. It's it's a quick and easy. Do you want to, can you speak to that a little bit, Aaron? Yeah, I'm, I'm flipping through my cards trying to find a good one, too. I mean, you know, that's... Uh, one of the um, the Sherlock Holmes ones is a good one. Um, it's it, it, kids like it. Um, when I first started doing it, basically what happens is every kid's in a circle, and you, you pick one child to be in the middle, and he closes, he or she closes their eyes, and then you pick a person to be the leader, and that leader starts doing different movements, 
and the person opens their eyes and they're trying to figure out who the person leading the movements is. So when they're back, the person in the middle's back is to me, I ch I'm the leader and I change the movement slightly. And then the person, you know, again, gives the kid a few guesses and the kids are active. And it, you know, it teaches kids, you know, and there's, there's other activities in here as well, but it gets them up, it gets them active. Does it teach anything? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm, I'm flipping through these as we speak, trying to find some ones that have some integration. Um, there's jumping rock, paper, scissors, which is one of my favorites in workshops I do. Um, instead of just doing rock, paper, scissors show, you jump and you do rock, paper, scissors show, and your feet together is rock, your feet apart is paper, and your feet in straddle is scissors, or front and back is scissors. So the students have to jump and show. And you know, if you're teaching math, you can talk about probability and you can talk about um, where that is. I know that they teach probability in high schools and that would work well for um, high school classes as well. So there's just a couple examples of things that, and, and again, I encourage you, when you put these cards in the, in the hands of classroom teachers, they will start thinking of all kinds of ways to integrate content. And that's where we've had most of our success in thinking of some more activities is basically given to classroom teachers because they know the content a lot better than we do. Good, good. Um, a couple questions um, about administering this, and I know um, you touched on it in your presentation, um, and maybe just you know repeat. In my experience, and my my interaction is that the PE teacher is a great person to be the champion for active and healthy schools within the class. They're the ones who can help um, organize how the recess organization is going to be and getting um, some aides or some paraprofessionals, um, empowering them to, to run the recess in an organized way, getting the teachers on board with classroom activities, nutrition. Um, maybe speak to that a little bit again as the PE teacher possibly being the champion for this in a school. Yeah, I, I think the, the PE teacher's job in this basically is, is to think big and act small and be the visionary and say, look, we could do all these things, but we're not going to do all those right now. We can try. I've got these two classroom teachers, and they want to come meet with me and find out ways to get kids more active in the classroom. And they might come to PE during a planning period and see how their kids act during PE. Um, and it could be that you have another parent that's really into to walking to school and thinks it's important, and they want to organize safe routes to school. So you put them in touch with some safe routes to school folks. They get ideas. Um, they have a meeting. And it, 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 the, the PE teacher is kind of overseeing all this, but it doesn't have to be the PE teacher that stays every night so the gym can be open for the local community for a joint use agreement. It doesn't have the PE teacher that takes their, their planning period to go give activity breaks or go organize recess activities. It's a variety, and the PE teacher is really spearheading this, but it's by no means is the PE teacher the only one that can do this. It has to be a community to really make this successful. Great. Um, okay, let's see. I think that about wraps up our questions. Um, card, okay, there's a couple more questions about um, the manual and the cards. Um, the manual, again, it's a $95 manual. The cards, we have those split out in a number of different packages from individuals to classroom packs um, based on different grades and recess. Um, you can find them on our Gopher website. Again, the activeandhealthyschools.com website has some great information, too, as far as some um, videos. There's, I believe, a pilot from um, a school in Mesa, Arizona, um, and all the reproducibles come with the manual, too. Um, at this time, uh, I want to first of all thank you, Aaron, for your presentation. Um, some great questions, and um, hopefully it kind of got people thinking a little bit about active and healthy schools as a part of their school. I do want to um, announce our winner of the cards. It's David Smits from Holland Christian Middle School in Michigan. So David, we'll be in touch with you here shortly, and we'll get those sent out right away to you. also want to remind everybody that an email will be going out um, to all attendees with a certificate of participation um, that you can submit for educational credit, continuing educa education credit, certifying that you are part of this webinar. Um, also keep an eye out for future webinars. This will be a monthly um, Gopher Solutions webinar series, um, and, you, and our, our webinars are typically the third um, week of every month. So um, thanks again, Aaron, and we look forward to seeing you at another webinar.